In this second economic chapter, which is uh, thankfully quite a lot shorter than the first one, there's still quite a lot to get through. This is reading 15, Economic Growth and the Investment Decision. What we're covering in this chapter is we're looking at what causes economic growth. Where does growth come from? So what are the different factors of it? If we break down growth into different components, we can try and model how the different components of growth can affect total GDP. We look at equity and fixed income, in particular equity, where we look at how stock markets and long-term growth link together. We then look at the production function. If we're going to try and model mathematically what economic output is, what are the inputs, and how do we put those into an algebraic equation? Uh, and this is all called growth accounting. So what factors do this? We're going to have a certain number of numbers on this, so we need to do some calculations. We then look, and that's, that's, to be fair, that's the majority of the chapter. We then look at three growth theories that you need to know, uh, classical, neoclassical, and endogenous. Uh, and they are, uh, they give three very different conclusions as to where the long run stable economic output is. But one of them doesn't even say we're going to be stable. Uh, so those are three growth theories. Uh, they link to the idea of convergence to do different countries converge at the same level of economic output or to the same level of economic growth, uh, or both. And then how we open up the economy, the incentive to open up the economy. Uh, we begin, what are the factors of economic growth? Or in particular, what factors differ? Uh, what factors differ between uh, developing and developed countries? So the growth of a developing economy uh, has a number of factors relative to a developed country, and, and six six factors are suggested. Um, first of all, savings rate. Uh, you need a certain amount of savings. Savings go into the bank, the bank can lend them out. And so the savings are the starting point, if you like, for private sector investment. Um, maybe for public sector as well, but primarily the banks are taking in cash and that can be lent out to their, to their customers. And so that is essential for private sector investment. If people, if we take a talk about a developed, a, a developed country, then this may be nice and stable. And uh, we talk about the marginal propensity to save. But with a developing nation, typically incomes are lower, savings are lower, and therefore lower investment. Therefore, it recycles a lower GDP, and that could be a vicious circle, a uh, vicious cycle. So you end up having. Uh, you need to try and encourage more savings to try and break that cycle. Financial markets. They are an intermediary between savings and investments. We, we talked about this, in fact, at level one equity, all the different factors of financial markets. They are acting as a go-between between, between organizations and individuals who have got funds to set aside, either as loans or as investment equity investments. So they're putting money into the system in the hope that they'll take out a larger amount of money in the future. On the other side, you've got organizations that need money now in return for which they promise to pay back more in the future. And so the markets act as an intermediary between the suppliers of capital, for example, people and their savings, and the users of capital, for example, businesses needing to borrow or issue shares. And also through this, there's risk transfer. We know all about the derivatives market. You'll know a lot more about it by the time you reach your level two exam. And so through risk transfer, people that are prepared to take on the risk can sell risk product, whether it's derivatives or credit default swaps or all sorts of different products. Uh, and those who want to hedge their risks can do so using these different products. Rate identification, what is an appropriate rate to lend at? If you consider all the providers of debt capital, people who are putting money into the system, and all the borrowers, people who need the debt capital, if there's an imbalance in supply and demand, the rate should adjust. If there's a greater supply and not much demand, the rate will move downwards. If there's not much supply and lots of demand, the rate will move upwards. And in a free market, bond yields will naturally end up at an equilibrium rate. Of course, you need to consider different bond yields for different types of risk, but it's all part of this equilibrium, so the, the rate identification. And of course, liquidity generation, the fact that you've got a market where people are buying and selling every day means um, the financial markets can help provide that liquidity for people that have requirements. Um, if, we have got, uh, if we have got a developing country, then 
the, the, it won't work smoothly like this. So uh, an efficient market is, of course, very useful for growth. But if you have got uh, poor debt markets or very limited uh, credit uh, facilities, then that's going to prevent the markets from running. So if you don't have a developed bond market in the country, then it means it means there's less incentive for uh, savers to put money into the banks. They may not earn much return. And there's less ability for um, investors to borrow money from the bank in order to invest. Um, legal system and property rights, you need a good legal infrastructure. You need to know that if you buy an investment, if you buy equity or you lend money, you are protected. You're going to get your money back. Of course, there are always going to be risks associated with this, but it means you have protected rights. You can't suddenly have a company that says, we're going, for example, to issue loads more bonds, more senior than these bonds, because that's detrimental to a lot of investors. That's why we have covenants in the indenture. Um, on equity, you can't suddenly, you can't suddenly have a um, board of directors saying we're removing all the voting rights from a certain type of share if they're built into the structure of the company. So you've got legal system, you've got property rights. If you own property, uh, property meaning any type of asset, then that is enforceable. In developing countries, you've got weaker legal system, you've got less political stability, you've got corruption. So all these things can help to uh, prevent these from being enforceable. The law only works if it can be upheld. And so property rights may not be as strong, may not be as enforceable. And therefore, why should a country, why should, and why should investors from outside the country invest if there's going to be something like, uh, I mean, we've seen situations, for example, in Argentina, where the government has said, we like this company, we're going to remove it uh, by force from the previous owner. And this is not going to help foreigners invest because it's saying that your property rights are less secure and therefore there's less of an incentive for you to invest in our country. Public education and health, these are linked together. Uh, although education and health may seem very different, they tie together very strongly because if you've got strong literacy and high health and, and good health, then that's going to encourage people to work. It's going to encourage um, productivity. Uh, and so where you've got developing nations, consider countries such as China and India, uh, which have got very strong culture of education and in good public health care uh, will result and you end up with a much stronger economy. Otherwise, uh, it's, if you've got lower, uh, lower levels of literacy and health, you end up, uh, and health, you end up with far greater social problems, you end up with um, far lower, I mean, incomes are lower, maybe unemployment's much greater, and of course the health of the population would also be lower. So big difference between developed and developing nations. Tax and regulations. Um, tax, we have talked in the previous chapter about how fiscal policy can um, push for growth or hinder growth deliberately through fiscal policy. Um, if we've got a country where, a developing country, where let's say there's very little tax actually collected, uh, then that's obviously going to have less ability to influence the economy. Uh, the idea of regulations, that can help promote entrepreneur entrepreneurship, so it can help try and push businesses to start if it's saying they're going to be protected um, and if regulations are uh, for the benefit of small businesses then that can help job creation for example. Um, if you don't have a strong regulatory environment then it may well be that there are lots of cowboy firms out there that, and, and it ends up meaning it means that running starting a proper reputable business may be much harder. Um, international trade and capital uh, if you've got a low savings rate, for example, foreign capital can break that cycle. So low savings rate, but suddenly lots of foreign direct investment coming into the country can help break that vicious cycle and then promote investment. Um, so FDI, very, very useful for developing countries, uh, enhances capital stock. Uh, sometimes countries have barriers to trade. Uh, we talked about bar uh, tariffs and quotas at level one. Uh, and these barriers will often prevent FDI from taking place. So it's saying, if you're not going to be able to uh, generate uh, profit and repatriate it, then there's no point investing in that country. So there are a number of differences between developed and developing nations, and the curriculum talks specifically about those six factors. Now, a little bit of mathematics. Stock market versus economic growth. Uh, 
We've said, and I actually mentioned in the previous reading, the idea of potential GDP being the rate of what's called full employment or the natural rate of unemployment. A growth rate is how fast GDP can grow before you get too much inflation. So typically in real life, it's going to be no more than a couple of percent for most countries. We need to look at the link between equity prices and between the economy. Now, looking at the algebra here, the algebra should be fairly obvious. P equals at P being equity prices, GDP times E over GDP times P over E. The two GDPs cancel, the two E's cancel. So algebraically, this is fairly clear. But let's now have a look at what it means. The price levels are going to be linked by, you've got GDP, you've got E over GDP, which is what proportion of GDP is represented by corporate earnings, corporate profits. Probably a relatively modest proportion, but what is the proportion of total output that is provided as company, that comes as company profits? And then P over E, what is the overall market PE ratio? How much are stocks worth relative to those earnings? So for the whole economy, the whole, the whole not the economy, the whole stock market. And so therefore, we can see that overall price levels of equities are linked to GDP, they're linked to the share of GDP in earnings, and they're linked to the price the market puts on those earnings to the PE ratio. In the very long term, earnings growth must match potential GDP growth. So this is what we've got, so E over GDP. Earnings over GDP in the very long term, that needs to be relatively stable. Because if it's not, if it's not stable, it's going to trend. It's going to trend up or down. And so what we've got, E over GDP, think about E over GDP. What proportion of GDP is, is company profits? If it trends one way or another, you end up with a ludicrous scenario. Because I mean, let's say for argument's sake, 5% of GDP is corporate profits. If it trended upwards, then a bigger and bigger proportion of GDP would be corporate profits. You can't go above 100%. In fact, you can't go anywhere near 100%. Likewise, if it goes down, you can't drop down towards zero because otherwise there are no profits. And if there are no profits, then the stock market has no value. And so there has to be a level between zero and 100%. And therefore, in the very long term, it's got to be pretty stable. Yeah, we're not saying there won't be short-term fluctuations, but if you look at sort of uh, multi-century time periods, it's got to be reasonably stable. Likewise, P over E, the overall market PE ratio. If you look historically over centuries, what have PE ratio, what have PE levels done? And they haven't particularly trended up or down because they can't do. There is no reason why the P-E ratio is going to trend upwards because it reaches a point, I know during things like bubbles, during the dot-com bubble, P-E ratios went to ridiculous levels, um, but it corrected. Likewise, P-E levels can't go particularly low. If you look back at uh, the early 30s Great Depression, they fell significantly, but they, they can't fall forever. And when they were very cheap, people like Ben Graham said, let's come and buy up as many shares as we can, and subsequently did very well out of it. So again, there needs to be this long-term, uh, this long-term stability. Uh, so there we go. E over GDP needs to be roughly stable. P over E needs to be roughly stable. Conclusion is, although GDP will steadily grow over the years, so will the aggregate value of equities. And that's what this is talking, that's what this slide is describing. Uh, hence, in the very long term, the earnings growth and the uh, potential GDP growth need to be need to be the same.